بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله العليم الخبير المتقن نظام العالم بلا معين ونصير فسبحان الله الذي حكمته بالغة وعلمه غزير ونعمه واصلة إلى كل صغير وكبير ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له في نقير ولا قطمير ونشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا محمدًا عبده ورسوله الذي هدانا بكتاب منير ودعانا إلى الله بالإنذار والتبشير صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه ما دامت الكواكب تسير أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والله أخرجكم من بطون أمهاتكم لا تعلمون شيئا وجعل لكم السمع والأبصار والأفئدة لعلكم تشكرون صدق الله العظيم Honorable scholars, respected brothers, elders, sisters, esteemed listeners and viewers The verse I recited before you is a verse of the 14 Juz, the 16th chapter of the Quran in which the Almighty most eloquently says to us that the beginning point of every human was ignorance. When we exited from the womb of our mothers, may Allah preserve them with goodness, those that are alive and those that have moved on, may Allah envelope them in His special mercies. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. La ta'lamuna shay'a, you knew absolutely nothing. The Arabic poet said, تَعَلَّمْ فَلَيْسَ الْمَرْءُ يُولَدُ عَالِمًا وَلَيْسَ أَخُوْ عِلْمٍ كَمَنْ هُوَ جَاهِلُ Have the passion to learn because whoever possesses knowledge was not born with it. They needed to acquire it. In fact, at the point of birth, we did not even have the faculties to acquire knowledge. It was with the gradual passage of time and the different milestones that the vision was developed, the hearing was developed, the grasping ability was developed, and hence Allah says in the verse thereafter, وَجَعَلَ لَكُمُ السَّمْعَ وَالْأَبَصَارَ وَالْأَفْئِدَةَ And then He developed your vision and your hearing and you gave, gave you the heart, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ So that you can be grateful. And yet in another verse of the same chapter, Allah then fast forwards to the tail end of the human life. Wallahu khalaqakum. Allah created you. Thumma yatawaffakum. And then ultimately, He will cause your death. Waminkum man yutawaffa. Some are those that are given death at an early age. Waminkum man yuraddu ila ardalil umur. And then there are those who are given a prolonged life from which some are returned to a wicked life, a wicked age. وَمِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُرَدُّ Some from amongst you are returned to an unpleasant age. The word return is suggestive of the fact that we were there before. You don't use the word return if you're going to a place first time. If you're going back to your native country, be it the Middle East, be it the subcontinent, be it an African country, you say, I'm going back, I'm going back. But if you're going first time, you don't say, I'm going, to, I'm going back to London when it's the first time you're going. The fact that Allah says He returns you to that age of dependency is impressing upon us that we came from there. And that was our childhood. Of course, the difference is that when we were babies and we were dependent and we could not eat and we had diapers, it was the pride of our mother to take care of us. And when our elderly folks reach that old age, fortunate are those children who tap into that moment and seize that opportunity and exploit it objectively to serve their parents. Otherwise, by and large, unfortunately, unfortunately, that old age becomes a liability in many a society. May Allah protect us from that. The Arabic poet said that, وَدَيْنُ النَّاسِ يَوْمًا سَيُقْضَى وَدَيْنُ أَبِيكَ لَنْ تَقْوَى عَلَيْهِ 
You can gradually offset the favors of every person, but you cannot begin to offset the favors of your parents. Medical science talks of gerontology, the study of the aging, the cultural, biological, cognitive, and psychological aging of the body, wherein Mother Nature starts claiming back all your resources in installments. The vision went, the urine went, the teeth went, the hair went, the walking went, the mobility went, almost a baby in an adult form. So the beginning, you were not in a position where you could acquire. The latter part of your life, you weren't able to acquire knowledge. That leaves you with a stint and a gap in between. And this is the period in which we need to acquire knowledge. The ideal period is the youth. Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah said, وَمَنْ فَاتَهُ التَّعْلِيمُ وَقْتَ شَبَابِهِ فَكَبِّرْ عَلَيْهِ أَرْبَعًا لِوَفَاتِهِ If a young man lost his youth and missed the train and he did not use it objectively to enhance himself, you can probably figuratively offer four takbirs of janaza prayer over him because he might be physically alive but he's spiritually dead. وَذَاتُ الْفَتَى وَاللَّهِ بِالْعِلْمِ وَالتُّقَى إِذَا لَمْ يَكُونَ لَا اِعْتِبَارَ لِذَاتِهِ The excellency of a child, of a human, of an adult, of a young man is measured by knowledge and piety and not by anything else. In English they say, you are only young once, but you can be immatured indefinitely. You are only young once, but you can be immatured indefinitely. Some people grow old, they don't grow wise. Society needs wise people, not old people. There was a time where wisdom was synonymous to age. Wisdom was synonymous to age. Unfortunately, no longer to say that if you are old, that equates wisdom. Now, let me move forward because time is ticking away very swiftly. Every one of us needs nurturing. So Allah is perfect, flawless, impeccable. And Allah makes the direct tarbiyah of his prophet. Delegation came to the Prophet ﷺ and they asked him three questions. Tell us about the people who slept in the cave. Tell us about the man who traveled the east and the west. And then tell us about the reality of the soul. The Messenger ﷺ said, come to me tomorrow and I will tell you. And Allah speaks about it in the Quran. And inadvertently, he ﷺ slipped up to utter the word, insha'Allah. And of course, he's a human ﷺ. And that does not go against the station of nobility and piety. He is the paragon of Allah's creation. But Allah makes the direct tarbiyah of a Nabi. So there was a pause in revelation. And after 15 days, the verse came down. وَلَا تَقُولَنَّ لِشَيْءٍ إِنِّي فَاعِلٌ ذَلِكَ غَدَى إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ Oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, do not say in future or commit to anything until and unless you say insha'Allah with it. The message was communicated, impressed upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and of course he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never omitted the mention of insha'Allah. The point is, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, like every Nabi, received direct revelation, and in that was the tarbiyah that was taking place. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then nurtured his companions. They nurtured those on. Unfortunately, by and large, today we have a society where there is nobody ready to tell us or we are not accessible enough for people to advise us. So we up in our actions in terms of recitation in virtue, but there's stagnation in our reformation. 
I need my dad to tell me. And someone needs to tell my dad. I need to tell my student. I always say as a student when I was studying, I used to pray to the Almighty and we are students our entire life. Oh Allah, make me a good child to my parent and a good student to my teachers. And I tried and I endeavored and I labored and I toiled till I summited this hill. And when I got to the top of the hill, lo and behold, I had the cap of now fatherhood on me and the cap of a teacher on me. And you can be a brilliant child, but that does not equate to a great father. You can be an amazing student, but that does not equate to a outstanding teacher. So now I realize, you know what? It's a learning curve altogether. The Prophet of Allah receives revelation till the last. Why is it that we read certain points in our life that no one can tell us? How many a youth will come home late at night? Parents are in panic and anxiety. When the boy walks in, he's created such a blockage that both of the parents sigh with relief, but neither of the two can muster the courage to ask him where he was, least he throws a tantrum. My young boy, if that's your attitude, you've dug a hole nobody can fill. The Prophet ﷺ is busy giving da'wah to some people. Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum walks in. He ﷺ just feels that the presence of Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum for the moment is inappropriate, but he was visually impaired. I'm engaged with these people. And Allah revealed the chapter, Abasa wa tawalla an a'ma. Did he frown? Because a blind person came and the Prophet ﷺ immediately then welcomed him and said, Marhaban biman atabani fihi rabbi. Welcome to the person regarding whom my Lord has reproached me. My point, my reflection is, come the month of Ramadan or on a generic note, we increase in good actions, which is noble, is meritorious. Don't lose the point. But hang on for a moment. There is nobody telling me that's the recipe for disaster. Excuse the expression. Excuse the expression. When you are in the washroom and you are in the loo and you have the call of nature and you need to defecate, no human is offended by the stench of his own feces. Excuse the expression. You never heard a person that was offended by his own stench. If he's courteous enough, he will spray something after he leaves to be sensitive to someone else that comes in. Well, that's how you are and that's how I am. You don't know how you sound to your spouse. You don't know how you sound into your employees. You don't know your body language. There has to be someone in your life and my life to tell me, listen, that was arrogant on your part. The Prophet ﷺ said a person will go to hell because of the utterance of one word. It will drop him in, well, in hell a distance greater than the east and the west. And why? He utters a statement which offends someone. La yara biha ba'sa. But then he screens his own actions. He says, no, I think it was right. He needs to be told. He's got a chip on his shoulder. He's arrogant. If I'm not going to tell him who's going to... So he utters something out of line and then he justifies it himself because the screening process is done by Allah and not you. I cannot be the advocate of my mistakes. And that is why we have stagnation. Look at the rich era of the Sahaba where it was an open discourse. They were being told. So then they were being nurtured. So then you had humans that were being, being manufactured. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah said, ذَهَبَ النَّاسِ وَبَقِيَ النِّسْنَاسِ قِيلَ وَمَا النِّسْنَاسِ قَالَ أَلَّذِينَ يَتَشَبَّهُونَ بِالنَّاسِ وَلَيْسُوا بِالنَّاسِ Actually, it looks like humans are becoming extinct. And now we got a creature left on earth which is look like humans, but not humans. What did Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah say? He said, humans are becoming extinct. 
Umar bin Khattab radiyallahu anhu delivers a talk and he says, لا تغالوا في مهور النساء Do not give your woman folk exorbitant dowries. And let me say a qualifying statement. Many people today who are prejudiced against Islam will intercept this narration to this point and then malign Islam with misogyny. Listen to the full narrative. Listen to the full narrative. Don't take an extract out and then level your accusations. Sayyidina Umar, giving a public address, he says, لا تغالوا في مهور النساء Do not give women exorbitant dowries. A woman challenged the position of Umar bin Khattab. That were our golden days where I could be told my point is a prophet, which is the purest of Allah's creation, receives revelation to the last day. How is it that I reach a point in my life when no one can tell me? I've been doing marriage counseling for the last 22 years. And often I say to the senior folks that even if we have not reconciled the union, the fact that your spouse challenges your verdict is a good enough benefit to deflate your ego because you're the boss in your work you're the main person in the neighborhood you're the trustee in the institution you sit on the hierarchy so nobody can challenge you it is only Allah that cannot be told yes there is a protocol of communicating which is a topic for another day so this woman came to Umar and she said, are we bound by what you say or what Allah says? So Umar radiallahu anhu says, no, you're bound by what Allah says. So she says, this woman, that there's inconsistency in what you said and what Allah has said. Allah says in the Quran, وَإِنْ أَرَدْتُمُ اسْتِبْدَالَ زَوْجٍ مَكَانَ زَوْجٍ وَآتَيْتُمْ إِحْدَاهُنَّ قِنْطَارًا فَلَا تَأْخُذُوا مِنْهُ شَيْئًا that if you dissolve in one union, one marriage, and you're moving on to a next one, and you had given the former spouse a large treasure, then don't claim it at the point of dissolving. The fact that the Quran made reference to the former spouse having a treasure releases a hint of permissibility to give your spouses large treasures as dowry. I, I hope I'm not too philosophical and people are grasping me. What, what, what did Sayyidina Umar say? أَخْطَأَ رَجُلٌ أَصَابَتْ إِمْرَأَةٌ It's not the first time I have erred. I have erred previously as well. And yet again, a sister is correct. In fact, I have realized everyone is more learned than me. In, in, in the glory old days, and this happens to the real pious where their spiritual immunity is of such a pure level. If a person eats pure, wholesome, organic, GMO-free, natural, uh, something that's not adulterated, then he or she will take a sip on the juice. This is not pure juice. This is not pure honey. This is not, uh, you know what, this is artificially grown. This has been injected. The system is so pure that as soon as you give something fake, immediately the system responds. The pious were so internally clean and pure that whenever they offended, insulted, or did something, there was an alert within them. There was an alert. No, no, no. Umar bin Khattab was walking. Iyas bin Salma makes mention of it. And then uh, the person, he says, my dad narrated this to me. So he was walking along, and Umar radiallahu anhu was a man with, with, with vision. He was very visionary and he had meaning and objective. He didn't like to see people lame, inactive, and lethargic. What did the Urdu poet say? Hazar kaam hai daag dunya mein karne ke. Jo log kuch nahi karte hai, kamal karte hai. There's a thousand things to be done in the day. And I wish I can make my 24 hours into 30. I simply cannot digest how people say, no, I'm sitting bored. I don't know what to do. How, where's the word boredom and monotony in the language of a believer? Like the day is running by, Ramadan is just ticking away. 
One of the scholars said, if the dwellers of the grave had to be told, Tamanno, make an expression, make a desire, they all would unanimously say, I wish we can have one day of Ramadan. I wish we can have one day of Ramadan. So Umar radiallahu nudged him and said, hey, move. So he moved. A year later, Umar ibn al-Khattab met up with him. He said, uh, I believe you're going for Hajj, indeed. He said, okay, istain bihada ala hajjik. Take the 600 dirhams and use it for hajj. Thank you, appreciated. Then Umar ibn al-Khattab said, Annaha min al-khafaqati allati khafaqtuka aama awwal. I've given you this to offset the abuse of authority that I had inflicted on you last year when you were walking. So he said, Umar, ma dhakartuha hatta dhakartaniha. I don't even know what you're talking about. Oh, yeah, okay, kind of. Umar said, I haven't slept properly for one year. How Musa, the Prophet Musa bin Imran, the hadith of Bukhari and the verse of the Quran, he stands up. Qama Musa khatiban fi bani Israel. He delivers a talk. In the public address, somebody asked him, Man a'lamun nas? Oh, Musa, who's the most learned? He, alayhi salam, said, Ana, I am the most learned. And academically, his reply was correct. He was a prophet. And for the record, he's amongst the Ulul Azm prophets. I don't want to go into detail. My time is running against me. But he features amongst the greater ranking in the galaxy of the prophets. So he was asked the question, who is the most learned? He said, me. His answer was spot on, was objective, was academically correct. The hadith of Sahih Bukhari, فَعَتَبَ اللَّهُ عَلَى مُوسَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reproached Musa alayhi salam, إِذْ لَمْ يَرُدَّ الْعِلْمَ إِلَيْهِ Because he did not direct knowledge to the Almighty. So Allah said, O oh Musa, you got to travel to the confluence of the two rivers, to the junction of the two oceans. There is a servant of mine there. He possesses a particular skill and science and knowledge. You are unaware of the basics of this knowledge. Leave alone the absolute details. Look at the spirit of Musa. He prepares immediately and he travels. You're talking of Musa, the great prophet of Allah. In Bayanul Quran, it is written the reason why Allah impressed upon Musa to travel that, O oh Musa, when you speak and you reply, exercise caution when you speak. Exercise caution. The Prophet Musa was the most learned, and he answered that I'm the most learned, and Allah disliked the reply. I am not learned and I don't have knowledge. When I'm going to claim it, can you imagine how despicable this will be in the eyes of Allah? But because nobody can tell me, my teacher used to say, don't be so naive and foolish that you assume everything you're doing is right. Some are silent out of dignity and others are silent out of desperation. But everybody's watching what you're up to. Umar bin Khattab is sitting. A person passes wind. He releases flatulence. So obviously the atmosphere is now unpleasant. So Umar bin Khattab says, Azamtu ala sahib al The person who's passed wind, can you please stand up and make wudu? Usaid bin Hudayr comes to Amirul Mu'minin. Umar, 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 Umar. Allow me a minute. Can I whisper something in your ears? Yes, go for it. In a moment of rage, am I accessible? Am I amenable? Just the other day, my beloved father said to me and my siblings, and may Allah bless him, and I keep on saying it. Every day he sends updates on our chats. Do this, do this, beware, be careful. We don't realize how we're sounding. When there's nobody to tell you, oh boy, oh boy, the world, the world is, is, is a dangerous place because your ego can just take you to another level of conceit. Umar, why don't you ask everybody to repeat their wudu? In doing so, this man's condition would be camouflaged. Everyone would make a new wudu and they'll be fresh. And what did Umar say? 
نعم السيد كنت في الجاهلية ونعم السيد أنت في الإسلام You were an amazing leader in the days before Islam and you are just so amazing after Islam Umar bin Khattab is patrolling the streets of Medina He sees there's a flame He tells Abdullah ibn Mas'ud wait here He scales the wall He goes in He finds an old man sitting بين يديه قينة There are young girls singing and he's drinking alcohol he says, ما رأيت منظراً أقبح من هذا I've never seen something more wicked than this in my life So this man said to Umar, point taken What I did was wrong But the manner in which you are addressing my wrong Is just so evil and wicked if not worse Now, you can argue till the cows come home. No, no, don't justify. Don't counter argue. Don't go in defense mode. So that's how we go back and forth. So I don't change. I don't change. A person once came to a great scholar and he said, I've been backbiting about you. I'm going to be frank and candid. I've been backbiting about you. Will you forgive me? He said, I'll forgive you, provided you divulge what you were backbiting. Because it's wrong for you to backbite, but I could be guilty of what you said. So if you don't tell me, which doesn't justify for you to say it, I will know it. Wow, how alert they were to better themselves. My point is, I'm going to mention a, a formula through which we can have someone, you know, that guidance. So Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu asked the person, so what's the way forward? He said to Umar, I'm committing wrong, but I'm not brazen and blatant. I'm not flamboyant about it. I'm doing it secretly. They're just sister. You came searching for my wrong. And Allah said, rectify the wrongdoer. But Allah didn't say, go search. You came within my private house and you seen me doing a wrong. So you are guilty of searching for my faults. Number two, you scaled the wall when Allah told you, enter from the door. And number three, you entered without salam. And Allah said, Sallimu. when you enter the house, greet. Umar said, I apologize to you, I apologize. A period passed, the man didn't come to the masjid. Umar was hurt about it, that I didn't approach the thing in the right way. Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu was one day giving a talk. He seen the man inching the masjid. He said, Aliya bin Shaykh, please summon that Shaykh and bring him forward. As he was brought forward, he said, Udnu minni, come close. Then he said, Adni minni udna, give me your ears. And as his ears were brought closer, he said, I just want to tell you that what happened that night I haven't divulged it with anyone. I haven't divulged it with anyone. Back in the days when there was a quarrel and a feud between two people, then the third person tried to stop it. Today, in social media, the third person videos it and shares it. That's the world. Wow, wow, wow. Amazing. Great. And then circulate it. That's the world in which we live. And what did this man say to Umar bin Khattab? What did this man say to Umar bin Khattab? I'm ready, happy to tell you that that which you witness on that day, it was the last in my life. I did it. I never repeated it. So I leave you with this last advice and quotation and conclude because my time has lapsed. The scholars say there are four ways of reformation. Number one is musahabat, where you adopt the company of a pious person and you allow for spiritual transmission. If your car battery is flat, you cannot merely park it next to a car where the battery is, uh, you know, it's got, uh, the battery is charged. You need to connect the cables. You need to rev the engines. You need transmission to take place. So sheer association is inadequate for spiritual transmission. You need that good to be internalized, to imbibe, to, to, to implement it. So one is musahaba. The second is muhasaba, introspect. You retire to bed, you ask yourself, how did I speak to this one today? How was I with that person? How much money did I spend? I won't forget this brother. I was in Sri Lanka on a lecture tour. And then uh, I went to a massage parlor, male therapist. Male therapist, I, I like to qualify that statement, right? And so he really went the extra mile and he said, this is my priest and he's my imam and please, you know what, he's having a lecture tour, take care of him and give him a good massage and a hot stone and deep tissue and the rest of it. So I told him, it's going to cost you a lot. And his words ring with me. He said, Imam, I don't audit the money I spend on others. I audit the money I spend on myself. I don't audit and check when I spend. 
recently a man came to me, he says, my dad is ill and I've been paying for the medicine and my siblings are not coming to the party. Can I claim it from the inheritance when my dad leaves? I said, my brother, Allah's opened a door. For heaven's sake, don't shut it. Allah's given you an exclusive door of opportunity. Do you have the funds? Yes. Run with it. You run in your paradise. So you introspect. You make muhasaba. The third is wa'ad bil ghair. You look around you. You see things. There was a time this man was giving zakat. Now he's receiving zakat. There was a time this man was like this. See what happened. You apply your mind. How life is turning. The one who views the world at 40. The same as he viewed the world at 20. Has surely wasted 20 years of his life. Things are changing. I got to be putting my lenses of maturity on. How am I seeing? How am I observing? And the last out of the four is Mu'akhat. Mu'akhat was where the pious would actually pay up with two and enter into a frank relationship, be it with a sibling, be it with a partner, be it with a friend, be it with a neighbor. Listen, I don't know how I carry myself and I will never know because my own never offends me, my own stench, my own anything. If mucus is running from my child's nose, I can use my hands and clean it. And if somebody else's child, the mucus is running, and in a gathering, oh, that's so uncouth, that's so uncultured, that's so raw, that's so unrefined. Okay, so my own, even if I use my hand, it's not uncouth. But if somebody else's, it's uncouth. This is how tolerant we are to our own. We're not realizing how we're talking, how we're behaving, how we're walking, how we're conducting ourselves. So they would enter into this relationship of mu'akhat, where frankly, one another would tell each other, listen, I watched you yesterday. Your prayer was not right. Your wudu was not in order. You know, when you walked into the masjid, the way you dropped your shoes, your body language gave off arrogance. Your body language gave off arrogance. Sadly, we are a society that will prefer fake praises to inflate our ego than constructive criticism to rescue us.